Hello. I wanted to share my thoughts today on something that I've been working on lately and what I consider to be a part of this vow. When we take the Bodhisattva vow, we take these, uh, or when you do the aspiring Bodhisattva vow, you take these eight precepts. And one of these I find to be very compelling and something I'm working on actively right now, which is this one of how to protect your bodhicitta from degenerating in this life. And it, the third one is do not give up working for sentient beings even when they are harmful. So yesterday I went to our local prison and it was just the most beautiful day there. And one of the wonderful things that happened was one of the inmates there renewed his refuge. And the time we went before, uh, he, and he had taken refuge before with Venerable Children and he wanted to renew it with me. And so the time I was there last month, they had done a refuge ceremony for three of the fellows with Judy, who is the long-term volunteer there, which was just a really beautiful experience. And, uh, but he wanted to renew his refuge as, through me because Venerable Children had given him his refuge initially. And I think he had maybe fallen away from Buddhism for a while. And so it was a really very sincere time. And in my mind, I'm just sharing my own thoughts. I find that this vow of not giving up working for sentient beings, in, even when they are harmful, to be actually one of the problems of our society, actually. Um, the couple of the men I talked with yesterday, they're just so sincere in what they're doing to turn their lives around. And it was clear from the conversations that Venerable Losang and I had that they had been in trouble since they were young. They had been in juvenile detention, I think, and now they're kind of more in midlife and they're, um, you know, when a person chooses to change, they can change. But I find that in our society, a lot of times, we don't have that recognition. And I think this is one thing that attracts these men to this Buddhist group, because it happens to be a Nyingma group and they really emphasize Buddha nature. And these fellas always hold this with a kind of awareness that they have the Buddha potential. And it's so helpful for their minds. And then we go in there as volunteers and we show them just the decency of respect that would, you would give to another human being, which they don't experience much during the course of the day. And so for some of these guys, like yesterday, it was just so apparent. Um, one person had said to, to me, I guess, or maybe said it to someone else, but I had learned about it, but he's never getting out and for him, Saturday, the day the Buddhist group meets, is the highlight of his week. It's what he looks forward to. These are the things that give life meaning. And another fellow there was just so, he just loved the day so much. And there was just, I don't know why, but yesterday there was all, because of the ceremony, the ceremony is just so meaningful for everyone. There was this great feeling of joy and expression of gratitude that happened after that. And in just of subtle, you know, simple ways, but it really struck home to me, like this one guy who said, you know, I woke up in just a, such a good mood this morning. And, the, and then this day here was so lovely and he just had a sense of joy. And this is not something that is easy to come by when you live in that environment. In fact, prisons have the highest suicide rate, I believe, at least in the training I do every year for that. That's what they have, the statistics are they have the highest rate of suicide amongst any type of group. So that tells you something about what people are faced with there, you know, that kind of situation. And so many of those people there have done harmful things. Some of them might be innocent, who knows. But the thing is, is that our role as a society, our school systems and our various systems can't be giving up on people so quickly. And that's what I see in our society sometimes. I've seen it in our school system when I tried to adopt my nephew. He was only 14 and the school system had already given up on him. 
they, they had the idea that once a teenager was a certain, you know, at that age, this was a, this, somebody explained this to me, they, you know, they're kind of like, well, they're just kind of labeled by then and they're just, you can't really, you can't start afresh. That's what I learned from that experience. And it was, when I talked to other people about this, it was pretty much confirmed that you're labeled, it goes along with you, and it's difficult to break out of that. And the same thing happens when these people get out of prison. They're felons. It's hard to get an apartment. It's a really huge issue in this country right now about housing for people that have uh, this kind of background. It's one of the causes of poverty. People are out on the streets. You can't get work. Even President Trump, Trump recognizes this, and someone is has uh, talked to him about that, and he may make some efforts to try to help this, because it's a real problem that, you know, these folks, they've done their time, they get out, and it's hard to get going again. So we can't give up on people. And what I see in going to this uh, prison is that, and what we experience with our prison program here is that people change. People can change. And so we have to, um, I see this personally as a Mahayana practitioner that this is part of our, this is part of my commitment is to, when I read this vow, I think about my interactions I have with other people, but I think about it more rather than just personally, I think about it more like as a society. And I think that that's my, I wanted to just share my thought on that, how beautiful it is when we don't give up on people and the changes you can see people make at all ages. I just think it makes no sense to give up on people at any age. If we have multiple lifetimes and we have the Buddha potential, that means there's any t at any point we can change. If it doesn't change this life, it might change next life. You never know what the seeds are. I took uh, my nephew to a to a meditation practice for like 20 minutes in the time that he lived with me. It made a, a really strong impact on him that never left him. A 20 minute interaction at a beautiful Buddhist temple setting where he you know, had one experience in his life about trying to calm his mind and that experience never left him. So these small things that we do to, in our outreach in whatever way we do it have lasting impacts on people. They're planting the seeds, and if they don't come to fruition this lifetime, they may come to fruition in a future lifetime. So I, I think that we shouldn't discount any of our efforts. We shouldn't have expectations that people are going to, like say, for instance, a lot of people who practice Buddhism in prison might not continue when they leave. And that doesn't really bother me in the least. What I f think about this is that the time that they spend at the Buddhist group and everything they learn in that, you can't undo that. You know, when you've done an inner transformation of any, any kind, that stays with you. And so maybe you don't practice in the same way. Maybe your life goes on in a different way after you leave that kind of setting. But the impact that you've made and the seeds that have been planted for even the future are tremendous. So this is the attitude I take towards this particular vow and the relationship I want to have with sentient beings and what I want to try to promote in our society as a whole. Thank you for listening to my thoughts. <laughs>